Welcome to the tutorial for the first example of Phoenix. This tutorial will show you how to extract the refractive index and absorption coefficient of a sample when you provide a reference and sample trace from a terahertz time domain spectrometer. This first tutorial is called Basic Extraction and goes step by step through it. If you don't know how to install Phoenix or Python in general, please check out the previous video in this playlist. I will try to make this video clear and comprehensive. If that is for somebody too slow, feel free to skip to the part which you are interested in. But let's start. To run the example, we need to start Jupyter Notebook. There are two possible ways to start Jupyter Notebook. Starting it over the Windows menu, here in the bottom left, is a fast and convenient way if you have placed Phoenix in your home folder. If you access Phoenix, for example, on the network drive or generally outside of your home folder, you can start the Anaconda PowerShell, which is option 2. From there on you can switch to a specific folder and start Jupyter Notebook with a command line. First, let us try the first option and afterwards I will show the second option. We can click on Windows Start and enter Jupyter. Windows will autocomplete and show the program Jupyter Notebook. Enter and that's it. The command line will open and we can wait until Jupyter Notebook is started. If that worked out, you can keep this window opened. I will now close it and show the second option with the Anaconda PowerShell. We click on the Start menu and enter Anaconda. Pay attention to select the PowerShell and not the normal shell, since only the PowerShell makes it easy to switch for example to network drives. Open the file explorer and go to the directory where Phoenix is located. Afterwards, click on the top part to select the path of the current folder. Copy the path and go back to the Anaconda PowerShell prompt. Enter CD, which stands for Change Directory, space, quotation mark, and the right mouse click enters the full path which we just copied, quotation mark, and enter. We are now in the right directory and can enter Jupyter Notebook. After hitting enter, this option is also finished and we are good to go. As a note, you don't have to copy and paste the path every time. If we close the Anaconda PowerShell, and start it again, it remembered the previous commands, which can be accessed with the arrow up key. So next time you need to press two times the arrow up and it will bring up the change directory command. Afterwards, two arrow keys up and you have the Jupyter Notebook command. So we start the Jupyter Notebook and navigate to Examples, 01 Basic Extraction, Example 1. A new tab opens, and here in the beginning a few general Python libraries like OS, which is responsible for functions belonging to the operating system, NumPy for numerical arrays, Pandas for data frames, and Matplotlib for visualization are loaded. We remember our current dire directory with the command os.getcwd, which stands for get current working directory, and go two directories up. From this position, we import Phoenix as pk. We can execute the cell with shift enter. You can run the help command to see the package contents. Here is the name, Phoenix. The package contents, for example, artificial sample, extraction, optimization problem, and so on. To run the extraction, we first need to load in some data. Phoenix comes for this tutorial with some artificially generated reference and sample traces. This has two advantages. The noise in the artificial sample can be adjusted to see possible problems in the algorithm, and a ground truth is available since we know which refractive index and absorption coefficient should come out from the extraction algorithm. 
With real samples, even if they are well established and measured multiple times, like silicon wafers or lactose pellets, it would still be challenging, since local problems like inhomogeneous samples, not plain parallel phases of the sample, general scattering or misalignment of the terahertz TDS would make it difficult to assess if the problem comes from the extraction algorithm. At the end of the video there is bonus content showing how the artificial files were created. The file name artificialreference.txt is saved in the variable ref underscore file. NumPy's function load.txt loads the specific file and saves a 2D array in the variable ref. I print out part of this 2D array and also get the shape. You see the left column starts at 0 and has small but consistent increments with around 2e-14. The right column looks more random. The shape shows that this array has 4096 rows and two columns. Now I can read the text from the example. The first column contains the time in seconds, the second column the signal in volt. We can use the first column to derive the time axis for the signal and save it separately. We access all rows with the column operator and only select the first column with the index 0. We save this in the variable time. With shift enter we execute the cell. Afterwards we load the sample file in the same way. We also save the thickness in the variable sample thickness. In the SI unit meter. For the generated sample the input was 1 mm. Shift enter we execute the cell. Now we have all ingredients to create a data object with Phoenix. A time axis, a reference array and a sample array. We save this in the variable data. To see what we imported we can create a plot object. The function plot data is handy to display the loaded data. On the left subplot we see the reference trace in blue and the sample trace in orange. The time axis is 100 picosecond long. The orange trace is shifted due to the thickness of the sample and you can see dispersion from the sample's material affecting the terahertz trace. The right subplot shows the frequency domain with the same data and color scheme. The reference terahertz bandwidth is smooth and had a peak around 1 terahertz. It hits the flat noise floor around minus 80 dB. The sample trace in orange, on the other hand, has some absorption dips and is generally lower than the reference spectrum. For this example we know the exact thickness, but often we only have an approximate guess of the thickness, even though this is a sensitive parameter for the extraction algorithm. We use the extraction class and supply our data object in the bracket. The intermediate object we can save as extract object. As a first step we unwrap the face and use a method which calls to the same name. We need to supply the frequency interval in SI units so it is hertz, from 0.3 terahertz to 0.9 terahertz. Since we already created a plot object, we can supply the extract object and plot the corresponding phase. We can see in the upper subplot the reference and sample trace for the requested frequency interval. In the lower subplot we can see the unwrapped phase of the reference spectrum, the sample spectrum, as well as the division of both phases in green. If we only have an approximate guess, we can run the algorithm with many different thicknesses. Extraction with the wrong thickness tend to oscillate more, a feature which can be used to determine the optimal thickness. The method is ca called in the literature total variation method, since it measures the oscillations of the extracted refractive index. Before we supply multiple thickness values, we first need to get an initial guess for n, the refractive index, and k, the extinction coefficient. If you need alpha, the absorption coefficient, don't worry. This can be deduced later from k. Fortunately, Phoenix has already a method called getInitialNK.
The original algorithm is based on the paper from Pupeza and co-workers, where for the first time the limited amount of echoes due to the finite recording length was introduced. This is summarized under the parameter delta. In this case, max delta means how many echoes seem to fit to the rest of the sample time trace. Having these values, we can run the method getThicknessArray, which runs the extraction for the nominal thickness of 1 mm and varies the thickness range plus minus 50 micrometer. The chosen step size is 1 micrometer. You can see how fast the program extracts the requested information for each thickness. Below is a progress bar showing the progress, how many iterations are totally be in the loop, how much time is approximately left until it finishes, and how long the program needs per iteration. Instead of giving back n and k, different total variation methods are directly applied and are given back as a Python dictionary. We can see that the created plot shows a minimum at 1 mm. Depending on the sample, your terahertz TTS, and over which frequency span you evaluate the data, it can be that the total variation method does not give such a clear-cut result. It is always good practice to cross-check the results with real-world thickness measurements. After confirming our thickness, we now can start the real extraction. We repeat the steps from before and shows this time a frequency range from 0.3 terahertz to 3.7 terahertz. Afterwards, the sample and reference are too close to the noise floor. We unwrap and plot the face. We can also get the initial n and k, which are constant values, and plot these two. Looking at the time domain, we can not only measure the time delta between the peak of reference and sample trace, but also how many echoes or Fabry Perot reflections would fit in the remaining time trace. So the delta t is 2.5 picosecond and we have a maximum of 7 echoes. This information will be useful for the artificial transfer function, which is compared with the input data. Now we have everything set up and can execute the method run optimization. We only need to supply the thickness. We will receive the frequency, the optimal refractive index, the optimal extinction coefficient, and the optimal absorption coefficient derived from k. Since this example is based on artificial data, we can also import a text file containing the n, k, and alpha, which was used to generate the sample file. This allows us to see if the extraction is successful when we compare the extracted values to this ground truth. This is exactly what the next plot shows. The absorption peak around 2 terahertz seems to be too strong to throw the extraction algorithm off. Even though the extracted absorption seems to be less affected, the refractive index jumps up and later jumps down again. The algorithm works from one frequency to the next one. If the phase jump is too large, the algorithm loses track which results in a deviation of the refractive index. It is often helpful to zero pad the time traces, so that the frequency resolution increases. Even though we don't add new data to the measurement files, the smaller frequency steps make it less likely that there is a phase jump between frequency points outside the plus minus pi range. Since this was only partly successful, we now try the zero padding approach. We load the data as before, but this time window the traces, meaning the start and end of the traces gets gently pushed down to zero. Afterwards, we can add an arbitrary number of zeros to the end of the trace. We don't add any new data, so we cannot suddenly uncover new absorption dips if they were not in the raw data before, but we can increase the resolution in the frequency domain to make absorption dips better defined and frequency steps smaller, which should help with our phase problem. Here, the new frequency resolution is 2 GHz and the time trace is approximately expanded to 500 picoseconds. Afterwards, the same commands are executed as before. We extract the data, unwrap the phase and get the initial n and k. Note that due to the increase in frequency resolution, we have now much more points to evaluate.
Afterwards we can plot the results and indeed, the numerical precision was in the previous approach insufficient, but now it worked out. The extracted refractive index and absorption coefficient fit to the ground truth. You can copy this Jupyter notebook and can try to read in your data. With this, you already have a template and know which basic methods from the Phoenix class can be used. If you are interested, as a bonus is now the derivation how the artificial reference and sample trace got created in the first place. We go to the previous tab and open underscore generate artificial data Jupyter Notebook. We import the same packages as before and use interactive matplot plotting in the notebook. To generate some noise, we need a random number generator. I'm using the NumPy library and give it a seed value. This allows that one time pseudo random numbers are generated, but when executing the same file again, the same numbers are recreated. This makes it easier to track down possible problems. We create a time array with 4096 plus 2 elements, going from 0 to 100 picosecond. Afterwards, we use a Gaussian function, which is a method from Phoenix class, and supply a standard deviation and mean, which is here 0 0.2 picosecond and 20 picosecond. This will describe the width and the location of the Gaussian function. To see what we did so far, I'm plotting the Gaussian function as well as a derivative and second derivative. For numerical differentiation, we lose one element for every derivative. That is the reason why we created the original Gaussian function with 4096 plus 2 elements. The second derivative looks closely related to a single cycle terahertz pulse, which you could generate for example in a nonlinear crystal or photoconductive emitter. We take the second derivative and call this variable signal diff. We normalize the signal and create a standard normal distributed noise and reduce its strength to 1 e-5. This value was found to give the frequency domain later a dynamic range of approximately 80 dB. We add this noise to the signal. Since we took the second order derivative of the original signal, we also need to remove the last two elements of our time array. Afterwards, we create a frequency axis with the RFFT module from NumPy. RFFT stands for Real Valued FFT and leaves out the negative frequency component, which we don't need. We also create an array called Circular Frequency, which is just 2 times pi the regular frequency. We need this later when we create the artificial material. We save the reference pulse in time and frequency domain into the respective variable names. We describe the sample with a dielectric function based on various Lorentz oscillators. Part of these functions were inspired by the program FIT at TDS, which was developed in the workgroup from Romain Paretti and offers a graphical user interface and many possible models to fit to real measurement data. Here we want to take kind of the inverse way. We want to say the strength and the location of some oscillators corresponding to absorption peaks and create a dielectric function, which is convoluted with a reference trace. We set epsilon infinity to 3 and create the object DL for dielectric function. To be generated, it needs at least epsilon infinity, which does not need to be 3. It was just a number I picked. To make the refractive index and absorption a little bit more challenging, four oscillators are added to the object. The central frequency, damping rate and strength need to be supplied, the first two in terms of circular frequency, which explains the 2 times pi at the end. The locations are 1 terahertz, 2 terahertz, 2.1 terahertz and 3 terahertz. Especially the one at 2.1 terahertz can be challenging since it has a low strength besides a strong oscillation at 2 terahertz. We can give out a symbolic expression of the dielectric function which shows four oscillator terms plus epsilon infinity. The values of these variables can be accessed by get apps guess. Since it is a symbolic function, we can substitute the given values into the symbolic expression. This is nice to look at, especially for debugging purposes, but not too useful. Our goal is to get the refractive index and absorption coefficient as a ground truth, as well as a reference and simulated sample trace in the time domain, as if it was recorded with a Terra's time domain spectrometer. The first step can be directly read out from the object DL, 
The methods get n, get kappa, and get alpha give all relevant values. We only need to supply the circular frequency, which we want to later use. We have a symbolic expression of the dielectric function of a material. To create the material, which can interfere with the reference pulse, we can use this symbolic expression as an input model, but also need to give it extra values, like thickness, to create a real material, which is still artificial. Afterwards, we can use the transfer function to let the reference beam interact with this artificial material. We've set the thickness to 1 mm and convert the DL object, so far mostly an object consisting of symbolic expressions, to an object which can easily be evaluated with NumPy. We call this new variable DLNP for NumPy. Phoenix already has a method to create a transfer function. The ori original values of the four oscillators, as well as the epsilon inf, are given over the method get guess. Omega is a circular frequency for which the transfer function will be evaluated. DLNP is the object containing the dielectric function, which can be evaluated by NumPy, and the thickness we just defined in the beginning of the cell. To create the sample trace in the time domain, there is nothing else as multiplying the just created transfer function with a reference pulse and frequency domain. This is equivalent to a convolution and an inverse conversion from the frequency domain to the time domain gives us a sample trace with exactly the behavior we before defined. In the next cell, we plot the reference, sample and dark trace, where the last one was just the array with random numbers. We can see on the left side a delay of the sample trace due to the thickness, which we gave into the transfer function. There is also quite some dispersion, creating a ringing in the time domain. You can even see an echo from the terahertz pulse after it traveled back and forth through the sample. In the frequency domain, we can see the four oscillators and their respective strength. As expected, the normal generated noise in time domain behaves like white noise and makes a flat noise floor below 80 dB. The last cell allows us to export the time domain data from reference, sample and dark trace. You can play with the model above or around. Just keep in mind that you later can only evaluate in the frequency range where reference and sample trace are above the noise floor. Also, the strength of the absorption dips should be reasonable. If they are too deep, the value can dip below the noise floor and phase information would be lost, which makes a correct extraction of the refractive index and absorption from this frequency on very challenging or impossible without guessing. I hope you liked this introduction of Phoenix and can make use of it for your research. In the next tutorial, we can see how generally useful dark measurements are and how they can help when extracting the refractive index and absorption. I see you in the next video. Bye.